everybody, this is Raul for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the great honor and pleasure of chatting via Skype with bassist Robin Zielhorst. And so, welcome Robin to, to Bass Musician Magazine. We're happy to be able to chat um, yeah. all the way across from the Netherlands. This, again, I'm always impressed by technology. And <laughs> basically, as we always like to let our readers know a bit about you. Tell me about your startings, your beginnings in bass. How did how did you get started? Um, well, I grew up in kind of a, a musical family, I guess. Uh, I remember when I was super little that I was sitting on my father's lap on the piano, singing his songs and stuff like that. Um, so I, you know, I kind of grew up in that area. Uh, in that surrounding, um, and I started playing piano when I was about, I think, six or seven. Um, and, you know, after that, I, when I was about 12, 13 years old, um, piano was not so cool anymore, so I wanted to play in a metal band because I started listening to Metallica, and, uh, and I remember I wanted to uh, play guitar, which my brother uh, had played before. Um, so I borrowed his acoustic guitar and I kind of tried to play on it and it it worked but eh. Um, so I thought, well, I need a I need an electric guitar. So I went to the music shop with my dad and um, and there was this red Hyundai bass <laughs> and uh, which is not exactly a brand known for their bass guitars, but you know. Um, and I picked it up, and I, I, I don't know, I, it, it kind of clicked, and it made sense, and, you know, I, I started to play, um, uh, what's that, a Rage Against the Machine song? And, you know, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, I can do this, all right. So, uh, and, you know, that kind of got me into playing bass, weird enough, and, um, and after that it was, you know, Playing, uh, you know, Nirvana songs and trying to figure them out by ear. And after that, it was Iron Maiden, Ozzy Osbourne, and you know, and around that time when I was around 15 or 16 or something, um, I got into a little bit more extreme metal, Cannibal Corpse, and Death, and stuff like that. And you know, when I heard Human, uh, the album of Death with uh, Stevie Giorgio's fretless bass playing, like, that, you know, I want, I want to have that, yeah, um, so I started playing fretless bass, and, you know, um, and it, everything kind of felt like the natural way that, you know, playing fretless felt really, um, really, like it's like you're closer to the music somehow. Like you're, you know, the, the, I remember when I switched. I had two exact same bases, one fretted and one fretless. But I remember when I switched from fretless to fretted. It's like the frets were like major hurdles that I had to take somehow to to get from note to note. Mm -hmm. And um, so you know, playing fretless was apart from the whole intonation hell, of course. But you know, that really felt. Um, where I should be, uh, so I focused on that for for quite a while, um, and phew, then I went to the conservatory. I did the rock academy in, in Holland, which is like a pop pop music uh, uh, college, um, and you know there I discovered that um, all the technical metal that I had been playing all these years. Um, well, that's cool to have like the technical fast thing, but that doesn't mean that you can play slow stuff or or grooves like Jamiroquai or you know. So that was a big yeah. slap in the face. Like, oh, okay, I can't play eight straight. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, so I learned a lot from that. Um, and when I graduated on the Rock Academy in two thousand and four. Uh, you know, that's when I started playing my own bands and did Blue Man Group and, you know, Exhibius and, yeah. 
that's the that's the, the short musical history. <laughs> there you go. Now, cur currently, and and one of the reasons that we're we're talking is because I saw that you you are with One Godless. Is that is that a label right now? Uh, one got less. Yeah, that's the that's the the metal band I started in 2013. Okay. Yeah, uh, which is actually the first time that I write all the music and uh, well, not all the lyrics, but some lyrics, uh, which is like my own creation as a metal band. Yeah. Gotcha. And the the thing that particularly got my attention while we were talking was a series of videos. It's a four. And they're very interesting titles because it starts with turmoil, and then there's grief, relief, and ascension. And yep. so that this this sounds like a very deep uh, series of titles. What is what is this about? Because this is you on solo bass. This is not with your band. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's true. Um, well, the the background of it is a. Uh, that I've been dealing with depression for quite a while, and it's uh, not something I, I um, I'm really happy to talk about. But it's 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 the background of music, so it's sure. you know, um, and uh, it's the the depression is something that kind of uh, it has its upsides and downsides, mm -hmm. of course. Um, the downside is that it's it's not fun, and the upside is that it sometimes give you uh, a nudge in the direction that you uh, would like to go. Um, Music-wise, uh, you know, there's obvious more sides to a to a human being. So there's the for me musically, that's the progressive metal, you know, fusion metal, exhibitive cynic part. Uh, there's also the the um, you know the beer drinking fun having one got s you know do the mm -hmm. you know it, it's gonna be fine and let's have fun on stage and be hard and badass um, and there's also a, a very sensitive side that you know that's uh, that needs to have a musical outlet every once in a while mm -hmm. there was is uh, the part uh, the, the the turmoil part. That, that opening of that part, I, I've been, you know, fumbling around with that for a few years, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just something that kept on returning every, you know, every so many years, or any, you know, it, it's just something to, you know, uh, up your muscles and like, you know, but it never really came to something. Um, and a couple of months ago, I guess I was playing around and I decided, well, okay, I'm going to just record it. Um, and uh, day one, I failed miserably. <laughs> it, was a, mm -hmm. it was a big disaster. Um, so I uh, threw it all out. And the second day, I was like, all right, I'm just going to record it just so I have it. And, uh, you know, we'll just see where it ends so, up. Um, and it kind of felt good to, you know, like kind of close it and give it like a, uh, like, like put it, give it its place where it's, it's nice to have it there. Gotcha. Uh, so I really, uh, so I recorded Turmoil and after that I had this, uh, the grief part was like a super tiny flick of an idea that I had. Um, which I don't know. Like it, it, it feels like uh, once you've gone into that that boat on that river, mm -hmm. um, you know, I just got along that river and it kind of felt good. So I, you know, just followed the river and that gave me, you know, the rest of the three song. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, and it's it's. I think it's a very common thing with musicians because music is our voice music is our form of expression and so it is not unusual to express our sentiments and our feelings through our music 
and yeah. I believe that it has a cathartic effect where it helps us process through it. <laughs> and interestingly enough, many people that are not musicians will relate yeah. to something that they hear and go, that's, that's me. This is, he's playing my feelings or he's playing my song. And, yeah. and so many, many great musicians, when you look through yeah. a body of work in their lifetime, at some of their lowest moments, they wrote some pretty incredible music that people can relate to. And I think more so instrumentally, because one thing is lyrics. Many people get lyrics because you're saying words. But with music, the tonalities, the choices, the patterns, what you're playing out is on a whole different level, which touches people at a different level, just not words. It, it is like, oh, I, I, I understand what's happening here. Or I, feel, I don't know why I understand it, but I do. And if we look at humanity over history, there's been so many times where they've expressed musical feelings and things, and it's got them through their hard times. You know, uh, I think a great example of that is American blues, where a lot of that comes from, you know, times are hard. You know, <laughs> life kind of sucks right now. And... <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to play it out. You know, I'm going to play my heart out and other people that are experiencing this will relate to it. So that's, that's always very interesting. Um, now that we've heard those, what I will do for those that haven't seen these, I'll share the link to the, to the video, uh, kind of the collection of all four. It's a, it goes all the way place through. So that'll be great. Um, what what are your plans for the future creatively now that you've kind of got this going? Yeah, um, well, the, the solo wise, I'm not that sure. I'm you know I'm definitely tempted to to record some more stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, I'm uh, pretty busy with the, the finishing of the One God Less album and getting that released because uh, it's probably going to be out in May, starting June, somewhere around that. And so that's, uh, you know, there's there's a lot to do in that area still. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm doing some studio recordings. Uh, so, you know, there's a, there's a filled plate right now. Good. Uh, um, but, yeah, I'm definitely... You know, doing the solo thing—that's like you said—it's a whole different, different thing, and it kind of—it's uh, it, kind of cool to be. I'm, I'm really not that much into solo-based stuff at all, weirdly enough. Um, but it's kind of cool to have that opportunity to, uh, you know, like you said, like you to express those emotions just by music without any help of you know, drummers, guitar solos, or, you know, vocalists, or, or, you know, any, it's kind of cool to be that musically naked, and, you know, just kind of see what happens, and throw it out there, I guess. Yeah, you know? well, and it's, I'm always remiss if we don't talk, I know in the videos, I noticed that you're playing on Warwick bass, and I'd also seen, because I was just doing a little looking into kind of your history, a very beautiful wind bass. You're yeah. fretless, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah, so, I have uh, two main bases right now. Uh, I'm not much of a, <laughs> of a collector. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have two main bases. One is the, the, the Fred Warwick Screamer. Uh, it's the stage one custom bass. Uh, and I have a, a fretless wind bass. Yeah, which is, uh, I've had that bass for quite a few years, actually, because I got it when I was playing with Cynic. So I think I got it in 09, mm -hmm. 2010, maybe. Um, but it's, you know, like, fretless-wise, it's the, it's the best bass I've ever had. So it's, you know, I've, uh, 
it, it was custom built, so I had the option to do pretty much whatever I wanted. Uh, so I got a zillion knobs and possibilities on it, <laughs> uh, which I never use because flat sound. It's you know I don't really need to do anything because it sounds perfect the way it is. Gotcha. Um, so you know I I remember putting uh, Randy Fulmer, the the owner of Winbase, uh, <laughs> through you know quite a journey to put together all the electronics and the piezos and you know the weird stuff that I wanted. And um, and at the end he he nailed it and it's awesome but I don't use it at all because it's all on flat and yeah. <laughs> well, <Nope. you> know. <laughs> but um, but yeah that's the that's the fretless base and I have the Warwick uh, the Warwick fretless base. Yeah. Got you. And what other tools in, in gear wise are you using to get your voice and your sound? Um, I play through uh, I have a Demon preamp. The Navigator WT100. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. I think it's the only preamp they got, but it's the 19 inch rack mount preamp. Uh, and I got an EBS Fafner base amp. Okay. The head. Um, and that's pretty much all I use. Uh, Cap wise, I had a, a, a EBS 4x10 inch. Which was a monstrous thing. It was awesome. It was the best, biggest sounding cabinet I ever had. Um, but back then, you know, I, we didn't play with through cabinets. Um, so after a few years with that thing on my attic, it's like, all right, I'll uh, I'll I'll sell it. Um, but I definitely want to buy one back because it's, uh, it's it, you know it has so much definition and low end and. Rumble and you know, it's really, uh, it's great, great stuff. Got gotcha. you. And about, uh, how about more, pedals? Yeah, I was thinking because I'm the only thing I'm I'm using the arc strings, which is the the the, the DR high beams, the MR five one thirties, big nice uh, nice strings. And the uh, pedal wise, I only use a dark glass, the B seven K Ultra. Nice. Nice. Yeah, which is for one gun less. It's the the best sound I've found. No. Nice. Well, and I, I I always like to ask this because many times when our readers hear somebody's playing, they go, "How did he get that sound?" And there's a lot of factors that have to line up to get the sound. And of course, you know they can try what they can to duplicate, but a lot of times. You know, it, it's 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 very difficult to do, and I'm I'm happy for you that you have found the instruments that work for you without yeah. having to have 20 or 30 of them because that's usually the yeah. search for the perfect instrument and going, oh, this one I like this, but I don't like this, and then so forth and so forth. So yeah. that's that's really cool. Now I have to ask because it's also in your videos. <laughs> The banner behind you. What's what's that about? What does that what does all that mean? What's this? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good question. It's the uh, it's the ohm sign. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is the uh, if I say it correctly, uh, it's the uh, the as they say the first sound uh, that was uh, that was around. It's the first natural sound, and it's. I'm, I'm not sure, but I think it's got kind of a Buddhist thing to it. There you go. <laughs> I don't know, but I like it, and I uh, I bought it with my girlfriend when we were in Paris a couple of, a couple of years ago. Nice. Uh, so it's, it's been with uh, with us and me for uh, for a few years, and um, when I you know started to to record the the, the playthroughs and music thingies. Uh, I, I needed the background, and you know, I thought, well, all right, let's hang this in there. Uh, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Very cool. Well, as as I don't want to steal too much of your time, but also, if people want to know more about you and what you're doing, whether it be solo or with uh, one godless, where's the best website for them to find information? Uh, well, they can go to onegodlessofficial.com. Mm -hmm. uh, or they can just look me up on Facebook. 
I'm, uh, I'm the only Robin Zulhorst around, so that shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be too hard. Very cool. Well, Robin, thank you so much for taking time to share your journey and certainly your music. And folks, you know, again, this is always we always enjoy talking to bassists because it brings their work to the forefront and you get a chance to go, hey, let me go listen to this and, and find out about it. Um, so yet again, we've brought this live via Skype with all of the little quirky things that Skype has. <laughs> directly from Bass Musician Magazine. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me.